It is good to see everyone here. Thank you, praise team, for the beautiful praise team. I really like, I'm digging the sitting on stools uh, format. Beautiful. And thank you, Don, for, for praying for us. Today's a special day. Today is a special day. Uh, and I do want to say this. I have missed you, church family. I've been gone for three weeks. Two weeks ago, I was getting ready to preach in Galatians chapter 4 or chapter 3 and 4. And then my wife got sick and then Eliana got sick and then Emily got sick. And I decided on Thursday that I probably shouldn't go in case I get someone else sick. So I stayed. Uncle Bing, Elder Bing Alabada preached and he did an excellent job, probably better than I would do. And I was so blessed by that message. Last Sabbath, I was away in Wisconsin, speaking at Wisconsin Academy, uh, and Pierre, Elder Pierre, preached a very powerful, practical message that I really enjoyed as I listened to it. And today, I'm here to share with you about the book of Galatians, about the gospel, about the freedom that we can have in Jesus. Do you believe that we can be free in Jesus, that we can experience freedom in the gospel? When I think of the gospel, I think about you mothers. I would be remiss not to recognize at least a few mothers here. I have a good friend who flew here from Colorado. She was our secretary at Campion Church for six years, my friend Teresa, and she's here, a mother. I would be remiss to not remember my sister who's also here, an amazing mother. I would be remiss if I didn't recognize uh, my special wife who is a mother of two, hardworking, sacrificial mother. And I would also be remiss to, to not to neglect recognizing my own mother, who you have been praying for. As you know, I came here in the month of August. My mom had a stroke. She's alive today. She's here for the first time after she's, she has been out of, the, out of the hospital and rehab. And so thank you, mothers, my mom, for your sacrifice. And for all the mothers here, I have a special poem, poem from you. I wish I wrote it, I didn't, but this was from Helen Steiner Rice. A mother's love is something that no one can explain. It is made of deep devotion and of sacrifice and pain. It is endless and unselfish and enduring, come what may, for nothing can destroy it or take that love away. It is patient and forgiving when all others are forsaking, and it never fails or falters even though the heart is breaking. It believes beyond believing when the world around condemns, and it glows with all the beauty of the rarest, brightest gems. It is far beyond defining. It defies all explanation, and it still remains a secret like the mysteries of creation, a many-splendored miracle man cannot understand, and another wondrous evidence of God's tender guiding hand. Mothers, Thank you for being evidence of God's tender guiding hand. Let's pray. Father, what a special day this is. Yes, we had a baby dedication. We're going to experience a beautiful baptism at the end of this message. But I want to recognize our mothers here. I know firsthand what it's like, well, secondhand, as I see my wife care for our children. I saw my mom care for me. And I know this, I, I can begin to under, uh, imagine the, the sacrifice that our mothers make. So thank you, Lord, for our moms today. We recognize them. We glorify you for them. And thank you, Lord, that you have blessed us with mothers who give us a picture of your character. As we open your word and dive in and learn about your freedom and love, bless us. Give us an understanding of your nature, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So let's give a round of applause for our mothers. Can we do that? (laughs) We got to. So moms, your example is a picture of who Jesus is. It's a picture of who Jesus is. This message was, I was so blessed studying this message. We're going to be in Galatians chapter five, verses one through 15. We've been on this really three-month journey of covering the entire book of Galatians. Now we're studying the first half of Galatians, Galatians chapter 5, verses 1 through 15. You're welcome to turn there. There are some ideas in here that made me want to do jump, uh, backflips. There are concepts and idea, ideas in here that I have never seen before. And because I have been studying the gospel and studying about Christ's character, 
uh, God gave me some, under, some uh, flashes and, and a picture of his character that, that made me want to do backflips. And so I'm going to try to contain my excitement because I can get pretty enthusiastic and, and excited, excited. And just let me know if it's a little bit too much for you all, okay? But I'm just super excited about Galatians chapter 5, verses 1 through 15. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to discover what does it mean to be free, okay? What, what is the gospel and, and how does the gospel give us freedom? A question we're going to answer is this. If the gospel makes me free or sets me free, Am I free to do whatever I want then? That's what we're going to try to address today. What does gospel freedom look like? And does being free mean that I can do whatever I want? So I, I hope you brought your thinking caps. Do you have your thinking caps? Let's put it on together. We're going to dive deep. And then we are going to be blessed by a beautiful baptism. So here we go. I'm going to give it to you. Give two realities. Two realities of gospel freedom. Two realities of what? Gospel freedom. Here's number one. Are you ready? All right, here we go. Don't fail on me, blackboard. We are free. What word is that? Can you read my handwriting? Free from the... Okay, so I'm going to underline this in case, you forget, in case you forget. All right? We are... Number, reality number one. Okay, two realities of gospel freedom. Number one, we are free... From the law. All right, Nestor, what are you talking about? Let's go to the Bible. Let's start with verse 2. Galatians chapter 5, beginning with verse 2. Here we go. Indeed, I, Paul, say to you, speaking to the Galatians, the new Galatian believers, I say to you, if you become circumcised, Christ will profit you nothing. What is he talking about here? If you're circumcised, Christ will profit you nothing? You know the story. Paul's talking to the Galatian believers. This group of opposers called the Judaizers are trying to trick these new believers saying, look, in order for you to be accepted by God, you have to be circumcised and you have to keep the law perfectly. That's how you can have a right standing with God. And Paul comes on the scene and says, hey, 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 hit the pause button right there. Look, if you become circumcised, Christ will profit you nothing, Galatian believers, so don't listen to those opposers. And then notice what he says in verse 3. And I testify again to every man who becomes circumcised that he is a debtor to keep the whole law. So Galatian believers, you're listening to these, these opposers who are saying, in order for you to be saved, you have to get circumcised. And if you're circumcised, that begins your journey of keeping the law perfectly as a, way to, as a means by which you are saved. So, yeah, okay, Galatian believers, if you choose to be circumcised, then you've got to keep the whole law perfectly, to the T, scrupulous, exact, accurate. yes. Commandment number one, yes, two, three, four, five. I kept all ten commandments, and you have to constantly watch yourself. Look what he says in verse four. You have become estranged from Christ. You who attempt to be justified by the law, you have fallen from grace. Paul, what is Paul saying to the, new, the, the believers here? He's saying, look, you are divorced from Christ. Those of you who are trying to be justified by the law, that's a theological term for those of you who are trying to be saved or trying to be accepted by God by your obedience. And he said, he says that those of, those of you who have fallen for this lie, you have fallen from grace. You have fallen from grace, believers. Be careful, be careful, be careful. And then he says this in verse one, look. He says, stand fast therefore in the liberty by which Christ has made us free. And do not be entangled again with a yoke of bondage. What's he saying here? This idea that, that your circumcision and your perfect law-keeping will save you, that's called bondage. A uh, modern term for that is slavery. This kind of thinking is slavery. Paul's saying we are free from the law as a means by which we are accepted by God. That's what he means. Galatian believers, Christian church today in 2022, we are free from the law as a means by which we are saved, as a means by which we are accepted by God. Look at verses 7 and 8. You're still thinking, like, what is Netzer saying here? Look at verses 7 and 8. He says this. You ran well, Galatian believers. 7. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? Who hindered you, Galatian believers? Christian believers? Verse 8. This persuasion does not come from him who calls you. 
Did you hear what he said? This persuasion, this idea from the Judaizers, the opposers, who said that, who are saying that you have to be circumcised and keep the law perfectly as a means by which you are saved, these people, they're way off the wall. They're, they're way off. He says that that persuasion does not come from God. It doesn't come from God. Look at this in verse 9. I love this illustration. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. I was like, what is leaven? So I looked up leaven, and leaven, as you know, is a substance. It's typically yeast. What does yeast do when you put it into dough? It causes bread to rise. So I actually wanted to see the process. So I went on YouTube. Uh, it was a three-and-a-half-minute clip, and I put it at one-and-a-half one speed because I couldn't stand how she was talking so slowly. I just wanted to see the, the bread rise. So she put the yeast in. And because the yeast one was in there and she let the bread sit, what happened? The dough rised. What's Paul saying? Galatian believers, check this out. Christians, a little merit mindset, a little perfectionism makes a lot of a large perfectionism. A little merit mindset, what is, Pastor, what do you, what do you mean by merit mindset? This idea that somehow my circumcision and my works, my perfect obedience, is somehow going to merit the favor of God to save me? A little merit mindset creates a large merit mindset. And that is dangerous. I mean, Paul uses strong words in Galatians to the Galatian believers. Galatian believers, that is dangerous. In fact, these next these next two verses, uh, it shocked me when I started reading it in different versions. Look at verses 11 and 12. This is how bad, this is how bad this merit mindset, this achievement mindset was for Paul and for us today. Look what he says in starting with verse 11. And I, brethren, if I still preach circumcision, why do I still suffer, suffer persecution? Then the offense of the cross has ceased. And then he says this, verse 12, I could wish that those who trouble you would even cut themselves off. So, you know, I've always read that, cut themselves off. Okay, they should cut themselves off from the community. You know what the word is? They should emasculate themselves. <laughs> what? Paul, I know you're bold, but you're telling these Judaizers to emasculate themselves? To cut off their genitals? Like, what are you talking about? Look. To these, Paul is saying to the Judaizers, if you're going to go, if you're going to be circumcised, just might as well completely, complete the circumcision, for lack of a better way to phrase it. Why would Paul use this kind of language? Because he knew, he knew how dangerous this was. He knew how dangerous this thinking was. Paul said, you're not saved by your, your circumcision and your perfect obedience and somehow your perfect obedience is going to merit favor with God. He says this in verse 10, Galatian believers, I have confidence in you, in the Lord, that you will be, you'll have no other mind. Galatian believers, Christians, believers, I, I have confidence that because of God's grace, you're actually going to walk in the truth and not walk in that false teaching. And then he says this, he says in verses five and six, for we through the spirit eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. And then he says in verse six, for in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails nothing, but, what's that word that starts with F? But faith working through love. So let me write this on the screen. On one hand, you have what we call, um, we'll call it, the, did it just freeze on me? Hold on. This always happens. I need to get a blackboard, by the way. All right, so number one, we're free from what? Free from the law, okay? We learned that there's this thing called, we'll just call it the MM, okay, the merit mindset. And he's, and Paul's coming on the scene, verse six, and he's saying, look, this merit mindset is no good. It's actually faith. Faith mindset. That's, that's the way to live. 
For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails nothing, verse six, but faith working through love. Paul's saying, believers, I have confidence in you. Did you know that I, your pastor, has confidence in you? I have confidence in you that God, through his spirit, is going to to keep you on the straight and narrow, to keep you on the grace path. Do not, Paul's saying, don't be duped by the merit mindset. Live by faith, not works. Live by faith, not your sacrifice. You know why? Because if we're duped by this merit mindset, all we're going to think about is ourselves, and if I'm thinking about myself constantly, it's going to cause much, what word is that? is going to cause me much anxiety. Let me, let me illustrate it this way. <clears throat> I remember when I became a new believer in 2002, and I had no way to sort through, you know, what laws should I follow. And because I had no filter and I had no way to interpret it, what that was, I thought that I should follow all the rules. And so I immediately thought that the, the speed limit was also the law of God. And so I remember, I don't know if anyone can relate to this, but I remember driving and, and thinking to myself, wow, if I pass 35 miles per hour, uh, oh man, God's not gonna be happy with me, right? So I don't, this is what happened to me, right? I, as I've said, I'm a, I'm a recovering perfectionist, right? I'm a co- recovering Pharisee. And so I'm thinking, all right, gotta follow the speed limit. Lord, I'm sorry, I went two miles over, two miles, pro- two miles over, I'm sorry. That's how I was in my early Christian experience. Accuracy, exactness, merit mindset. And if I'm just just below 55 to 50 miles per hour at 54, God loves me. Now, some of you can't relate to this, this story. Let me share another example. I was in the country of Bali or the country of Indonesia in the city or the, is it an island of Bali, right? Island of Bali. Uh, we were there in a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful island. And... I noticed that in front of the homes and the businesses, they had their gods, okay? In Bali, unlike most of Indonesia, which is 90% Muslim, Bali has a very Hindu influence. And so the people, okay, the Hindus, they, they, they placed a sacrifice in front of their gods, in front of their home. Why did they do that? To gain the favor of their gods. Do you see what religion says? Religion says, I provide the sacrifice in order to be accepted by the gods. In Hinduism, I provide the sacrifice and the gods will accept me. In Islam, there is only one God, Allah, but it's my submission and my sacrifice and my diligence and my commitment that will cause me to be accepted by the gods. In spiritual religion, I provide the sacrifice to be accepted by the gods. But question, is there such thing as a secular religion? You know how religion is defined in the dictionary? A pursuit or interest to which someone ascribes supreme importance. So you might be here watching online or you might be here considering yourself as a non-spiritual person, but here's, what, here's according to the dictionary, a religion is, uh, to, to have a religion is, means that I have a pursuit or interest to which someone ascribes supreme importance. You might not believe in God, but perhaps your job is what you worship or your spouse is what you worship or your children are your supreme importance. Or your degree is supreme importance. Your GPA is supreme importance. So you could be a spiritual religionist, but you can also be a secular religionist. Let me illustrate it this way. Let's say that you're in a company and you want to rise in rank. There's nothing wrong with rising in rank, but you want to rise in rank. In order for you to be accepted by the higher level, what do you have to do? Grit, sacrifice, work hard. I'm not saying it's not, it's, I'm not saying that Uh, it's wrong to work hard, we need to work hard. But could it be that we have idolized our work, hard work, so that we can continue to climb? And what we do is we say, I will work hard, I will sacrifice in order to be accepted by the next level, level up, in order to be accepted by that tribe. You see what religion teaches? Religion teaches I provide the sacrifice in order to be accepted by the gods or to be accepted by my tribe. But you know what the gospel says? Jesus is the sacrifice so I can be accepted by God. I don't think you heard me. Religion says I provide the sacrifice in order to be accepted by the gods or people. The gospel comes along and says Jesus is the sacrifice so I can be accepted by God. 
It is not what I do and bring to the table that gives me acceptance with God. It is what God does in Jesus Christ to give me acceptance with God. It looks so close, but it's vastly different. And one path causes anxiety, and the second path, you know what it, ca- what it gives you? It gives you assurance. So I'm not constantly thinking, have I kept the speed limit perfectly? Have I kept the laws perfectly? Yes, there's a place for that. But remember, receiving faith is receiving Christ. My sacrifice doesn't merit favor with God. Only Christ's sacrifice merits favor with God. So this is what Paul means by being free from the law. I am free from the law as a way to merit God's favor. Is that clear or no? All right, any more explanation or is that pretty clear? All right, last, last um, point. So, so number one, we are free, what is it again? From the law, okay. Good students, you remember. Okay, number two, I am free, see if you can read my handwriting. I am free for the law. Two gospel realities. Number one, I am free from the law, but I'm also free for the law. It's simultaneous. Where is that in the text? Verse 13. Here we go. You guys ready? Verse 13, Paul speaking, for you, brethren, have been called to liberty. Freedom. That's another word for freedom. You have been called for freedom. And then he says, only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh. Question, am I free to do whatever I want according to this text? No. Paul's saying, we are free. We're free to do whatever we want. But he says, verse 13, you have been called to liberty, only do not use your liberty or your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh. In other words, I am, not, I am free, but I am not free to sin. Okay? Modern culture Modern culture says that freedom is freedom to do anything that you want, okay? Look at, look at look social media, look, go on YouTube, look at all the TV channels. We're free. We're liberated from these oppressive traditional hierarchies and structures. We don't need church and we don't need religion and we don't need institutions to tell us what to do. We are now free beings. But the reality is total freedom doesn't work. Two examples. Number one, my daughter, she's at Hinsdale Avenue Academy, pre-K. There's, it, sh- her and her friends enjoy playing in the sandbox and they enjoy playing in the playground. Uh, but I noticed that they're, they're limited in where they can run. You know why? Because they have a thing that's made of iron. I think it's made of iron. It's black. It's called a fence. And if it wasn't for that fence, they would be a, the kids would be a danger of running past, playing, playing tag, freeze tag, running past onto the road and getting hit by a car. Complete freedom doesn't work. You need boundaries. Let me give you another example. Let's talk about marriage. A marriage that does not have boundaries, that's not true freedom. It's not. Because if I'm not, if there's no, if there's no boundaries and I'm crossing that line, do you think that my, the other party's happy? So complete freedom doesn't work. We need boundaries to restrict us from from destroying ourselves, right? Or to to keep us from destroying ourselves. So then, Paul, what is the solution? Verse 13, here we go. Here we go. For only, for you, brethren, have been called to liberty, to freedom. Only do not use your liberty or freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through, what's that L word? But through love, serve one another. Yes, sir. I love it. Thank you, Paul. This is what he means. Being free for the law means, oh, you guys know what I wrote there, right? Being free for the law means that I am free to, ooh, I am free to love. Can you see it? Yes, it's on the screen. I am free to love. All right, I asked you to put your thinking caps on. Keep it on. I promise you I'm, I'm going to try to land this plane and give you some illustrations to make sense of this, okay? I am free from the law as a way to merit my salvation. God has provided the sacrifice, right? He's provided Christ so that I can be accepted by him. But see, when Jesus came on this planet, check this out, he saved me, right? 
So we'll call that redemption, that's an R. When Jesus came, he redeemed me. But before I, he even redeemed me and saved me from sin, what did he do at the beginning of time? He designed me. So what does this mean? That because of God's great love, he paid a price in my design, price number one, whatever that cost, it was really expensive, and then he paid a really expensive price for the second price, or the second cost, which was redemption. He paid with his life. So because God, because God designed me, and because God redeemed me, I am doubly obligated to love God in return. Does that make sense? You still don't get it. Let me use this example. Now, my, this, this illustration does not compare to what, what God has done for us in Christ. But let me use this as an illustration. Catherine risked, her, risked her, uh, her life three times for me. Number one, I said, Catherine, will you be my girlfriend? She said yes. <laughs> Number two, I got on my knees in October 2012 after I ran, the, I ran the Chicago Marathon. And I said, Catherine, will you marry me? What'd she say? Yes. All right? Risk number two. <laughs> Cost number two. And then on July 7, 2013, after she read her vows, and when the pastor asked Catherine, will you fulfill your vow, promise to fulfill your vows and, and, and commit your life forever to this man? Guess what she said? She said yes. <laughs> Three times. So I am triply obligated to love her in return for all the love that she gives me. In fact, let me illustrate it this way. Her, her vow, okay, it was, it was a very nice vow. I don't remember all the details, but whatever her vow said, right, whatever her vow said, it did not include uh, getting water for her at 1130 at night. It was not listed on the vow. But because I am triply obligated, because she has loved me so much, I am obligated, not because I have to, but because I want to, to get water at 11.30 and even, God forbid, 2 o'clock in the morning. Because not only do I want to, you know, ask, oh, what is the minimum that I can actually fulfill my vow for my wife? No, because, because she's triply loved me, I exceed whatever that vow is and I go the extra 10 miles because... She loves me despite all the mistakes and the, the, the foibles that I have. Hallelujah. This is what it means to be free to love. This is what it means to be free to love. That I can actually love God. Not his law, but love the lawgiver. And I can love the lawgiver. Why? Not because I, I should like try harder. No, but because, because Christ has designed me paid a price here, and then he has redeemed me. He paid the infinite price. And because he paid an infinite price, I am infinitely obligated to respond in love to him and to follow him and to follow his law because the law is expression of his nature and his character. Does that make sense? So that's how God frees me to love. And I will say this. Many people and many here think, ah, those commandments, that's old school. Forget that. I don't need the commandments. That's old school. That's for the older folk. All right? You know why many of us don't like the commandments of God? Because we don't like the command, we don't know the commandment giver. The reason I love to follow the vows in my marriage is because I'm in love with the vow giver, Catherine. And when you fall in love and you have a, a, a real relationship with the one who gave his life for you and you know how much he gave for you, you're not gonna say, oh man, I just can't stand these commandments. You're gonna say, okay God, what are your laws? And how can I go to the nth degree because you went to the, not nth, the zith, is that even a word? It's the zith degree, the infinite degree for me. I am obligated because you gave your life, you give infinity for me, thank you Jesus. So, gospel freedom reality number one, I am free from the law. Gospel reality number two, I am free for the law, which causes me to be free to love. But pastor, last but not least, pastor, 
What about the social realities? What about loving my neighbor? I mean, we're talking about Mother's Day. What about the social realities? Paul has something to say about social realities and loving each other as a church community, as Republicans and Democrats, as pro, uh, conservatives and progressives, as traditionalists and free, free birds, can do whatever I want. You know what Paul says here? Check this out. Galatians chapter 5, 13. For you, brethren, have been called to liberty. Only do not use liberty as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. Verse 14. For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this. You shall love who? Your neighbor as yourself. Verse 15. But if you bite, if you bite and devour one another, beware lest you be consumed by one another. For some reason, the idea of two pit bulls just devouring and biting each other came to my mind. He says, if you bite and devour another like pit bulls, believers, beware lest you be consumed by one another. And then I read verse 6, which will be our last verse, that I had never seen before. Like, I had never seen that, you know, he he asked that the believers, that the Judaizers be emasculated. I had never seen this paradigm before in verse 6. Check this out. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails nothing but faith working through love. Let me diagram this, and then we're done. Oh, man, this is this is amazing. Okay, I hope you you get excited as, as as excited as I am. Check this out. So he says that. Okay, let's just draw this line here. Okay. He says that circumcision nor uncircumcision avails nothing. Okay, but what, then what does he say? What's the pinnacle? He says, but but faith in who? Jesus Christ is everything. Do you know why we, we're like pit bulls sometimes and bite each other? This is why. Because, you know, these are, the, these are the strict people over here, and we're free. And you know why we bite each other? The reason why we, the free people bite at the strict people is because they, start, they, they identify themselves as the uncircumcised. In other words, their identity is rooted in the fact that they are not like the other party. All right, I'm going to hide and I'm going to come back and act surprised. (laughs) The free people, their identity is, I'm so glad I'm not like them. (laughs) Paul's saying, look, Circumcision, circumcision doesn't mean anything. But don't boast, Galatian believers, in your uncircumcision. Don't boast in what you are not. Oh, guys, this, this applies in so many levels. Talk about the abortion issue in our politics today. Man, those pro-lifers, who, thank God, I'm not like them, right? And over here, no, no, this is, that's, those are the pro-choicers, right? Those pro-choicers, right? And over here, ooh, those strict pro-lifers. How dare they? And their identity is wrapped up in who I'm not. Thank God I'm not like him or her, and thank God I'm not like them. It happens in the church. Ah, man, those progressives, too free, too free. Thank God I'm not like them. Thank God that we are strict and we hold to the values no matter what. And then over here, man, they're old school. Can't, don't they just get it? They're from a different, different generation. Thank God I'm not like them. And friends, I will say this. The more I identify with what I am not, the more I'm going to devour and bite people. What about families? What about, what, how, about how about our homes? Man, thank God I'm not like that free uncle over there. Whew. Man, thank God I'm not like my parents. Thank God. Friends, the more I identify with what I am not, the more I'm going to divide, to bite and devour people. <laughs> That's why Paul says, your strictness and your liberalness or your freedom, that's not your main identity. Your main identity is faith in Jesus Christ. In other words, it's not what I do, 
It's not what I don't do. It's what Jesus does for me. And the more I associate what with Christ does for me, the more I can actually love people who are different from me. Does that make sense? My identity is not what I don't do or what I do or not. It's not saying I'm not like them, thank God, or I'm not like them, thank God. My identity is I'm a believer in Jesus Christ and what he does for me. And you know what he does? He actually creates this thing called love, which comes by faith so that I can actually love people who think different from, differently from me. Now, friends, I don't want to be, I don't want to act like this is easy because there are some times in relationships where the values are so off and so different that there needs to be a time where there's a separation. I, I know this is it's a real, it's a reality because it's too, it hurts too much because the abuse hurts too much. But I will say this, that the more that I can identify myself, not in not being like that person or that person, but the more that I can identify with what Jesus does for me, that I'm a child of God, the easier it will be, not saying it's easy, the easier it will be for me to forgive, and the, I'm not saying it's easy, but the faster it will be for me to heal from the trauma. And as I believe by faith in Christ, <laughs> last word and I'm done. As I believe in, if I believe in, you know what he says in verse six here? He says, for in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails nothing, but faith working through love. Question, what's primary in the text? Loving people or having faith? He says, faith working through love. In other words, what's faith is primary. And I'm like, Lord, didn't you say that love is primary? No, 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 no. God tells us that faith is primary because it's impossible, it's impossible for me to love people that I don't like. But when I believe in Christ and what he has done for me, he gives me, he unlocks, he unlocks the capacity for me to love even my enemies. That's why the starting point is not love because within my own heart, I cannot love other people, even my enemies and even those who hurt me. But when I have faith in the one who loved me and died for me, even when I rejected him and I sinned against him, I say, whoa, what amazing love. And as I believe in that and I'm exposed to that, he changes my heart and then he gives me the capacity to love my friends and to love my enemies. And friends, I do want to say this. Faith. Faith. We are free from the law as a way to earn our salvation. But we are also free for the law. We are free to love the lawgiver at the same time. At the same time. And how do we enter this experience? Paul says this in verse 6. Faith working through love. By believing and receiving and enjoying that salvation. And there's a young girl by the name of Nela who experienced this in her heart. And we're going to witness a beautiful baptism here of someone who said, I don't want to live for myself. I want to live for Jesus. Not because I'm perfect, but because he's per perfect. And I have faith and believe in him, which helps me to love God and to help me to love others. So friends, we're going to witness this. We're going to, I guess, move a few things here.